always delighted to talk to young talent uh, such as yourselves uh, who are joining us today. And the thing I want to talk about is that there's a whole bunch of change afoot in the world, right? Climate change is, is bearing down on us. It's a huge issue. We're coming out of a pandemic. There are huge social rifts. India is going through, I, I think, a, a real moment. Uh, and I think many of us are deeply concerned about the schisms in society. And when we look at that, there is often this focus on consumer activism, right? How do we how do we show what we want in the world by the way we buy it? And that's very popular. And you, you know, people ask to boycott various random things and, and so forth. There is also, and maybe a little bit less known, but there's a lot of shareholder activism. How do we think about, especially when you get into uh, climate related issues, how, how can invest, uh, you know, long-term investors, shareholders think about changing companies and putting pressure on companies as shareholders and perhaps uh, Elon Musk's most la latest announcement could be called shareholder activism. Not so sure. Um, what we don't talk enough about, uh, and is an enormous, enormous opportunity, is employee activism. And there are two points of employee activism. There's the easier and the harder. I think the easier and the, one of the biggest signals you can send is, who do you go and work for? Uh, you know, SRCC, for example, and I know there's people who are joining from other colleges, you, know, the, you represent some of the top talent in, in a country of 1.4 billion. The kind of colleges uh, that would be at this level, you, you know, you're putting out a few thousand people every year. You take up all of the IITs, uh, some of the great colleges that exist in many of the metros and so forth. I'm sure many more coming up, but the reality is, our top talent still numbers in the tens of thousands across a country of 1.4 billion. Now, where and, and this is true for anywhere in the world, there's always this very narrow band of top talent, right? Where you choose to work, the questions you choose to ask your employers are a huge influence because most top businesses uh, thrive on the talent that they attract. And so for many of you who I'm sure are in your third year or your fourth year as you're going out into the workplace, one thing I just want to emphasize is that itself is a form of activism. Of course, you need to choose something that works for you, but it's a really important opportunity. The second form is, of course, once you're inside a company, of course, employees can exercise influence and so forth. But I, you know, I, I would argue that the first choice itself is even more important. And the reason I say that is it's really easy to get institutionalized, right? It's, it's easy to, once you join, you're part of a team, there is activism, but it's not, it's not as easy. You've drunk a little bit of the, the Kool-Aid that uh, the company's putting out. So, so how do you think about that moment? And there's, why I think this is particularly important is, well, there are two real advantages to employee activism. Number one, it's quite direct. And if I'm a company and I'm listening to my consumers, I don't actually talk to my consumers that much. Most companies are, are getting signals on the basis of, oh, okay, they're buying this product more than this product. Maybe they care about sustainability. Maybe not, right? Like there's uh, employee activism. You know, when you're sitting there having a conversation saying, should I join you or should I join somebody else? And the questions you ask are very direct. The conversation that employees can have with the company firstly is loud and it's direct. The second is you cannot bullshit your employees, right? When we talk about greenwashing and all of these things, that's for the consumer, right? I can put up whatever brand, but you know, you, you talk to, for example, <laughs> I won't name anybody, but you know, any, anyone in consumer products and so forth, they're like, yeah, this is the same as washing powder. We just add more water and we call it shampoo, right? Like employees know, they know what's going on. They know that actually they're selling some silly stuff. Right, and they know that they've got a huge markup because they got a famous actor. Like they get it, and they also know if the company's polluting. They also know if the company's saying nice stuff but really not doing it. So, if you having a voice in that or thinking about that is incredibly important because the rest of us, we just watch an ad, and we're like, oh, they seem like green conscious human beings, right? But the employees know 
and it's a really under leveraged space. You know, and it, look, it may be changing, but look, 83%, I, I was looking at some of the analysis that gotten around this study or in the UK, where 83% of uh, employees in the UK think their employers are not doing enough on climate change. And that's a big number. Now, what happens if that number becomes a make or break number? What happens when 83% of employees say, I'm not gonna work for companies that don't at least get us onto the pathway of 1.5 degrees, right? That's, it's one thing to say, I don't think you're doing enough. It's another to say, this is a make or break issue. And if, you, if, if this whole generation starts to make it a make or break issue, do you think companies are not gonna do enough on climate change? We need people, right? We need people to work. We need jobs, banking jobs, finance jobs, and so forth. It's a massive industry. And alongside that massive industry is a tiny industry that is emerging called impact investing. Now, why does impact investing even exist? I mean, because there's a belief that the mainstream investing doesn't really account for all the social outcomes, the environmental outcomes. Right? Why not? And should top talent keep flowing to business models that very clearly have spent 99% of their capital simply making rich people richer and nature poorer? This is an unassailable fact if you were to look at the last few decades, especially. Rich people richer and nature poorer. And they spend their 1% of capital either donating it or putting it into a bucket called impact investing. That, is a, that itself is unsustainable. And similarly, should top talent keep flowing to management consulting firms? I'm in the management consulting field, accounting firms, law firms, who essentially follow a similar model. Right? Essentially, whoever pays, I'm going to make that person richer. And often that includes borrowing from the future. Right? So there, I don't want to oversimplify this, right? Because there are massive reasons that people like yourselves will be attracted to such jobs. And I was attracted to such jobs, right? Uh, these companies really look after their employees. They're really great places to learn. They're professional. They uh, have huge influence and that's attractive. Influence is attractive to, to all of us. Right? And they do pay extremely well, right? Um, but there's also a lot of wishful thinking here. Right? When we say, oh, look, we can work for these powerful agencies and we can make change. That is not what history has shown us. They work with their incentives. And we are at the 11th hour, right? Especially when it comes to nature, but especially when it comes to sustainability, we cannot afford this notion of maybe I can make some incremental change or the kind of wishful thinking that comes with, I'll go in and I'll change that from the inside, right? And we need bolder activism. That's what the time has come. So the choices that top talent makes around who it chooses to work with is this massive underleveraged lever for change. And some of that change is afoot. It's not strong enough, but if you look at any of these surveys, like I was talking about in the UK, but like the US already, you know, if you look at some of these big social um, conversations that are going on, you know, 68% of employees think that or would consider moving uh, their current job if the organization does not have a strong viewpoint on a particular social issue they care about, even if that social issue has nothing to do with the work. So we're also bringing the workplace, uh, the society into the workplace. So there is that sort of employee activism. Some of that's challenging, some of that um, is not necessarily good, uh, but that change is afoot. And the question is, how do you really accelerate it? Because it's, it's right now, it's a drop in the ocean compared to what needs to happen. Like I said, those 83% of people in the UK need to say, not that I, that I don't think my company is doing enough, but I'm not gonna work for a company that's not doing enough. And that itself is gonna be a massive change. Imagine big oil in the last few decades if they didn't have top engineers. If the top engineers said, you know what, you guys are actually funding um, all these companies to counter the narrative of climate change, I'm not gonna join. Right. If, if top talent doesn't join me, we're a, we're a consulting firm. My, my clients, one of the big reasons they, join, they ask for us is they believe our, our teams are highly motivated and talented. 
My business model is dead in the water when someone comes in and says, you know what, I'm not joining here. I'm not joining for these next reasons. So there is real power in this. Uh, and I think it can make a big difference. So that's the provocation, right? How can you think about the question you ask of prospective employers and the ultimate employment choice you make as itself an incredible lever for change as part of your own activism? I will stop there and take questions. Thank you very much, sir, for those thought-provoking insights. And I was personally very intrigued by your views on employer activism as well as impact investing. So for the take the sessions further, I would now like to uh, invite Mr. Part Chaudhary to take this discussion forward. Uh, Part is the former president of the Economic Society and presently a third year economics major at Sri Ram College of Commerce and also an incoming business analyst at McKinsey and Company. Thank you very much for joining us today, Part. Uh, with this, I now hand it over to you to proceed with the interview. Thank you. Uh, thank you, so uh, thank you so and uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, that was an extremely provocating start. Employment in India, for instance, right? When you have such major unemployment, uh, because of that, largely the labor market is a buyer's market. Uh, I mean, especially in firms or in places where there is mass hiring involved. Now, in that context, I would believe that that takes up a lot of, that extracts a lot of power from the employees because we know that replacing them is pretty easy. So in such a context, uh, how do we move forward? Yeah, and I can tell I'm, I'm jumping into an economics discussion since you guys are very clearly bringing up supply and demand, right? Um, so firstly, then it's not a single market. Now, India has way too much unemployment. It has an incredible shortage of top talent. An incredible shortage, right? It, it is an economy that has grown off the back of a lot of services industries, but has not brought its educational institutions, its... Um, its skilling institutions along that journey fast enough. So you, you can't talk about the whole thing as, as, as one. And I, it is absolutely true and tragic that there was a mass market out there where uh, employees really don't have great rights. Uh, and have, you know, but you guys, that's not true, right? That's not true at all. Uh, you have incredible power in this market. There's not enough of you out there. And so I, this, the argument I'm making certainly holds true for top talent. I, I make the argument from a top talent perspective in only in certain geographies and in places that are more equal and so forth, you can really bring this argument all the way down. But it is often very hard. Um, I think there's a huge shortage. And so you do have market power here. Makes sense. Uh, I think we'll probably shift now to something more specific uh, to your experiences, right? For instance, you founded Dalberg's uh, first, first Asia office in Mumbai. Uh, so in your experience, how has the situation changed while you've been seeing, seeing it, right? So from the start to today, have you started noticing these trends actually coming across? Now, what I would say is that back then, the people who thought about impact consulting were more mavericks. And actually as a result of that, we got like really, really top talent because we didn't, we weren't hiring that, like we're hiring five people and we were just getting some people who were like, you know, the kind that was like, there's no way I'm gonna join the mainstream. <laughs> you know, they're just like passionate, but incredibly intelligent. Uh, and these people have done incredibly well for themselves, both inside the firm and some have left. Um, but over time, some of this has become mainstream, uh, some good, some bad. I mean, I think one is that we are seen as a strategy consulting house, and there are not that many top tier strategy consulting houses in general in the world, let alone India. So I think the experience that those, that first two years at Dalberg is seen as, you know, as an equivalent to other great places to work. So firstly, we started to attract people that aren't necessarily completely, I want to do impact. But we continued, we, our brand also grew. And so now I think the, the challenge we have is we have about 6,000 applications for, I don't know, 20 positions or something. It's, it's, it's a strange thing to feel like with, with a heart, was, and it feels bad in some ways, it's just really hard to get into. Um, and 
and we're working on how to also not just we're trying to make that even harder because we're also really interested in diversity and very interested in dealing with the, some of the huge socioeconomic biases that exist in universities and institutions like yours. Uh, and so that requires us to go even deeper and open the funnel even wider. Um, so that's been some of the change, but, but at, at the start there was more Mavericks. Uh, and now I think the brand has really gone. And yes, I would, I would say that there is maybe a few years behind some of what we're seeing in other markets, but um, young students today are asking these questions. They are wanting to be uh, socially minded and they, that's what they're demanding from their, from their workplace. Right, and when you talk of say steering people in that direction, right? So I don't know, at least from what I've observed, uh, social impact work is something which doesn't get the kind of popularity that say accounting or other supposedly considered top management roles do. So why do you think that that still exists and possibly uh, could an emphasis on a worker or an employee centric workforce or workplace, could that possibly change that? So I don't, I don't think impact consulting right now is not popular because of something to do with employee centricity, right? I mean, it's, it is not a mainstream, it's a new thing. It's not mainstream. I mean, my, my grandfather knew what an accountant was. So we're talking about a big journey, right? Like my grandfather did not know what a management consultant was, let alone what a, I mean, management consulting itself is known by very few people as is even a thing. And I certainly, when I applied, I applied to McKinsey and BCG, um, I applied without knowing what they were. And I only applied because someone told me to. My, my boss, who I used to be working with to you know, fund my college education, he was like, go apply to these places. I'm like, I don't know what they were. So believe it or not, it's a, it, you guys are all part of like consulting clubs and societies and so forth. You don't understand what a rarefied little bubble that is. I did not know what, what any of this stuff was. In fact, case interviews were taught to me by the first interviewer, interviewer I had, because I totally failed his interview. And it was like a dramatic fail, right? Like he asked me a question and I said, 36. He was like, what the hell are you even doing? And so he taught me how to do a case interview. So I would not be surprised that there is an enormous amount of uh, people who don't know. And also we're not broadcasting, we're narrow casting. You know, on top of already a rarefied set of people, a rarefied set of uh, job opportunities, we also only want impact mission-driven people. So I think that's, uh, now, what I would be more interested in is that as people think about advisory work, and it is a great profession, advisory work in general, not just what we do, but just advisory work, what you're trying to do, Prof, and other people is a great profession, is how do they become aware of how to do that better, right? Like, that, that's more interesting rather than the awareness of, knowing about impact, because like I said, impact is, exists because other people are not being impactful. That's the only reason impact consulting exists. I'd, be, I'd love it if in 10 years we didn't exist. It was, just, it was just mainstream, it was just the thing. Like, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example of very concrete things that can be done. So we have two lenses that we put, on top of just only taking on social impact projects, we have two additional lenses that we put on our work. One is we put a climate lens. That means when we give advice, we say, okay, where has the analysis led us? And has the analysis led us to a place where there's actually a negative climate outcome? And, it, and look, sometimes, I mean, anything to do with carbon is negative to some extent. So then we think actively about, okay, how can we either mitigate that or does it cross a red line that we're not willing to cross? So then we apply a, a climate. Every piece of advice has to go through this, regardless of who's asking. And the second piece of it, uh, thing that we put on is a gender lens. So we say, okay, every, uh, firstly, every data, can we disaggregate it further? And then advice, can we please note for our clients how this advice, like if I'm saying, you know, open these kind of bank accounts, how that's gonna be different for men and women. Now that's an example of something we do, fine. I think every advisory firm can do it. Why should you give advice today that might make the planet worse? Why should you give advice today that might actually hurt gender parity? Right? How, do you, how do you put some of these things in place 
is more where we're trying to push towards. So I'm not too, I mean, I don't, I'm not too concerned about the popularity of these things. We're anyway overwhelmed, <laughs> so we're fine. Um, what I'm more interested in is the popularity of what we do becoming mainstreamed. So I want people to forget about applying to us and start thinking about, well, shit, they should come into my workplace. Specifically about some of your experiences, right? So you've worked with a lot of NGO partners, you said on board of, uh, on the board of Educate Girls. So in your experiences here, uh, what have you observed about employee sentiments and productivity in this? Yeah, so employee centricity in the social impact space is a really important and vexed question. And the reason is that um, sometimes we can rest on our laurels, uh, not our laurels, we can rest on our mission. Oh, hey, this is such an important mission. I mean, we're putting girls back into school. I'm like, you know, that's amazing. I'm feeding children, that's amazing, right? So when you have that, sometimes it's really easy to be, to let go of, yeah, but I need to treat my people well. I can't just keep saying work harder, because of the mission, work, you know, work for less because of the mission. But it happens. In the social sector, one of the challenges is that we use the mission as a crutch. And actually, mission is a great way to attract people inside. It's not a great way to keep people. A great way to keep people is to serve great coffee, to have friends at work, have good, uh, pay them well. And look, some of that, those challenges exist because the world, you know, society is very bad at thinking about how to value things properly. So the most effective societies, whether it's Finland or Singapore and so forth, the, the highest paid jobs are in, in the, to do with serving the public, right? And that, that makes a big difference. Top, top talent goes there. So uh, I do think one of the shifts that we need to make is to start to get comfortable with NGOs especially, this is not our challenge, we're actually a private firm, even though we work on you know, social issues, but NGOs especially being willing to accept that they need to be paid more because they're doing the most essential work out there at the moment, right? They're doing, especially through, through the pandemic, some of the things that they were doing. But at the same time, the culture within NGOs needs to professionalize around employee centricity, the question that you asked, um, as opposed to just mission centricity. Uh, and and that is a that is a challenge, and it's a thing that we work with our clients on as well. I think that's interesting. Um, also, on similar lines, right? In terms of uh, you mentioned that when for Dalberg, maybe clients aren't really the constraint you're operating with. But even in that context, uh, the idea of say a net benefit to society being positive, right? And that's a great statement to make. But how do you actually go ahead and try to make that? more concrete in terms of measuring it or maybe actually being genuinely uh, secure in your analysis on that net benefit front. Yeah, and that, that's definitely the, um, the stickiest issue. And it's also what allows people to get away with greenwashing, right? Is that actually uh, in the social and sustainability space, there is a lot, you know, it's not as easy as tr tracking the money. And if you, if you can't track something, you're not gonna manage it well, right? So. So that's definitely an issue. I think the way we think about it, firstly, it can be done. So while it's difficult, it can be done and it does require investment. So that's like core to our work. We often are working with clients just to help them set up performance management frameworks on social impact. So how do you measure it? But the basic tenets I would say is be, um, be deliberate, right? So the difference between what I often see companies do, which is like, oh, let's measure our social impact is more like, well, there's things going on. Let's figure out what are the good bits. Oh, I run a taxi business. The taxi dude got more money than before. Fair enough. But what's more, inten what's more interesting is intentionality. If you say, okay, I'm setting up this company and actually in three years time, I want to achieve this outcome. I want this many girls in school as a result of our work, or I want uh, drivers in our taxi fleet to have increase their assets by 30%. And here's what I'm thinking. That's meaningful, right? And, and that, that process, very few people go through. No one, in finance, you don't go, all right, let's look at the last year. Oh, looks like we made a thousand rupees. Great, move on. 
No, because what people are like, yeah, but you said you're going to make 10,000 rupees. This sucks. Share price goes down, right? So we have to do the same thing with the impact while people just often treat it as a sort of mana from heaven, right? Um, and uh, so I, there are ways to put those processes in place. That's one. The second, I would say, is you should have red lines. Because I think not everything can be, uh, I don't know, if you, if you hear a philosophy, like this is the difference between utilitarianism and rules-based utilitarianism. Like we can't go around calculating things every minute of the day. So there are certain things which you set up rules for and some of those should be red lines, right? So we have red lines, for example, around climate. Uh, there's certain types of projects we know uh, if they veer further down a particular type of fuel source, we're just never going to do even though in any one instance, someone can make a big argument saying, yeah, but we're creating jobs, we're doing this, we're doing that. So we also you know, set up these red lines uh, around the work that we do. Uh, and I think companies could do a bit more of that as well. So those are the two ways. Right. I think uh, the idea of being intentional is something which is extremely important. Uh, in that context, right, when you're setting up such objectives uh, or key results, as you call them, uh, that's something which generally flows top down, right? So in that context, the focus does emerge on the leaders of organizations uh, to bring that kind of intentionality uh, to social impact, or at least ensuring that they're not being socially negative. So how do you think that changes the nature of leaders that we need in terms of the kind of mindset that students, right? Because a large part of the people here are students. So how do you think people should really be thinking of leadership uh, in that context? Yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a stronger believer in systems than in leaders. I mean, don't put too much of your faith in people emerging. Uh, I'm a product of something as opposed to gifted in my own right, is my personal view, right? Uh, and so I think that what we need to think about is what are systems that make there will always be a leader how does a system create a good emergent leader from amongst ourselves and i think i'll give you an example of things that we have in place where it's not top down uh, not fully top down right um, we we have a system which is very transparent about the business that we're trying to secure for the for us you know, there are all these partners and it's not, you know, I make it sound all great because lots of clients and stuff, but you know, of course, in a day-to-day -day basis, I've got, you know, 18 management team members who are like, we're the ones keeping this business alive. They're going out there chasing business, et cetera. But what business they chase is completely transparent to all staff. And what that does is that every so often, they'll be like, wait, why are we chasing this? Right, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't feel. Uh, this doesn't feel right. And then there'll be a conversation. Uh, that's just an example of a light, called a light version of an audit, but it's systems based. Another system we have is our brand isn't owned by us. Even though we're a private company, we took the brand and we put it into a NGO, into a trust. And then there's a bunch of people who there are are. Own, you know, their whole role is to make sure that when the Dalva brand is used, it's only used for projects that actually are focused on social impact. Now that audits our leaders. I can be whatever, to, I, I can, you know, be someone who can claim that I started Dalva here in Asia, but I actually can't do, can't run away with anything. I can't do silly things because I've put things in place or made agreements that ensure that my behavior is constrained. And that's what I mean by a bigger belief in systems than in leadership because I truly feel there'll be better and worse leaders, but I truly feel I can be replaced very quickly, very quickly in fact. Thankfully is what I would say, because it's, it's a great burden sometimes. Because we have a great team that's just coming through the ranks. And I know that the system continues to promote well-meaning, ethical human beings, and they'll go into a system which will make sure that they act well. So the thing to think about is incentives. Never trust a company on the basis of just what it says, or even it's past actions. These are fleeting things. You need to sit there and go, what is the incentives in this system? Is it an incentive to make money? And if it's incentives to make money, what is the way to make money? And if the way to make money is to behave badly or not care, 
or to borrow from the future, then that's what people will do. Uh, and I think that's, that's where you should focus on. Leaders will emerge, good leaders will emerge if those systems are right. Since you're putting such emphasis on systems, definitely in the workplace, uh, I'd just like to extend that to education as well, right? Uh, because that's where we are. So in that context, how do you think the system of education we have can evolve uh, to ultimately uh, transition into a place where everyone is being equipped with that kind of mindset, wherein you're being more holistic in terms of how you're analyzing things? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a, that's a very hard question. And I'm not completely equipped for it, but here's what I would say. I would just uh, maybe speak more personally, right? Like some of the biggest decisions in life and, and what impacts us are just not taught at school. And I don't know if they should be, or maybe they should be, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. What I would say is, you know, how you choose a life partner or you decide to choose multiple partners, whatever you do, it's such an important thing. I don't know where you get that training from. Certainly didn't get it in college. How you think about materiality, um, buying material things and what it satisfies, like knowing thyself is so important. You know, it, it took me, like everyone needs to go through their Buddhist moment. So if you could bring that forward, like it took me some pretty weird and interesting experiences that made me realize how much I actually need and how much I don't and what truly makes me happy. How do you fill your life with experiences or fill and maybe a university educational experiences that explores this subject for each of us rather than you're studying a particular academic subject and then society is telling you what it is that you want? Because that's what... I, my uh, experience in college was, which was like, okay, I, I studied stuff that I really loved. I was lucky to study what I love, but I was told, oh, and then the next step is X. And then the next step is X. College was very much academic. In nature. And I think somehow accelerating, I think wisdom is maybe what I'm saying. Accelerating wisdom for students would be such an enormous benefit. Thank you, sir, for that very comprehensive uh, yet detailed answer. Uh, so with this, I think we come to an end for the session. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your riveting and invaluable insights. I believe that I speak for everyone in the session when I say that we all had something fruitful to take away from the session. Uh, the Economic Society, SRCC, is immensely grateful to you for taking out time from your busy schedule for the summit. 